we're going to be looking at the uh, post-conflict restoration of Bosnia, well first uh, in Bosnia as governor after the war, but first uh, I'll take an overview of what happened, so what was destroyed and why. Um, so the extensive intentional destruction of cultural and religious property in Bosnia Herzegovina during the 1990 war, the symbols of ethnic religious affiliation and of a wider Bosnian identity was the greatest destruction of heritage, cultural heritage in Europe since World War II. Now the war was notorious for the aggressive campaigns of ethnic cleansing carried out by secessionist forces and their allies and an integral part of that campaign was the destruction of the religious and cultural symbols which marked the long historic presence of the groups targeted for removal, who were most often Bosnia's Muslims. And these, this destruction went hand in hand with multiple war crimes and human rights abuses. So far from what Ben Issacan's recorded in Iraq, that the cult, you know, there were uh, abuses after the destruction, this was part of this was part of a whole process. This was part of an ideology of removing groups, and it was removing their built heritage as well. So the destruction was rarely collateral. This is the Ferhadiya Mosque in Bani Luka, the night after its destruction, and you see passers-by just looking in amazement. Um, so the majority of attacks on cultural and religious property were rare, were intentional, systematic, and took place far from the front lines, so this was not collateral damage. So they aimed to remove from the landscape the material evidence of the expelled community's historic roots in a locality and to discourage those who survived expulsion from ever returning. Now the types of built heritage, built heritage destroyed or badly damaged were overwhelmingly religious and overwhelmingly Ottoman or, or associated with Muslims. So in Bosnia and Serb uh, Banja Luka, control Banja Luka, where there were uh, no military operations at any time, 15 mosques, 12 of them listed national monuments, including the 16th century Ferhadiya, which is, I don't know what's next, that was it before it was blown up, uh, were blown up along with other important Ottoman or Islamic structures, like the uh, city's ancient clock tower, which you can still still standing, that's the mosque in front, and the clock tower was destroyed uh, several months later. That's the, what the clock tower looks like now, or at least in 2003, I'm sure it's the same now. Uh, elsewhere, uh, in small towns like Stalats and Foča, they were devastated by the well-organized demolition of their historic Ottoman cores, with all their mosques and entire Muslim neighborhoods systematically destroyed. So this was the Alija Mosque in Foča before its destruction. This is in 1996. This was the Muslim neighborhood um, uh, Prijeka Čarša in Foča, taken by, this was taken by a news reporter. You see the Sarava Mosque still undestroyed at this point. That was it before the war, and that was when uh, Richard Naival went there in 2000. Uh, so there was also damage uh, and destruction to some Croat and stroke Catholic and Serb stroke Orthodox heritage, such as this uh, lovely Austro-Hungarian period uh, church, Catholic church in Nevesinje. This was the site in 2003, and the Orthodox cathedral in Mostar. That's the one up on the on the hill. And that was also the site in 2003. But structures with no ethno-national affiliation, but which symbolized or held evidence of Bosnia's cultural diversity and centuries of coexistence, such as museums, archives, and libraries, were also targeted. And most uh, notorious were the shelling of the National Library in Sarajevo. Here it is in flames. That's the interior. That's from the War Crimes Tribunal evidence and uh, also the Mostar's Ottoman Old Bridge. By, uh, this was destroyed by secessionist Bosnian Croat forces. Uh, that was set during the war, just as it was destroyed. So in rural settings or urban fringes, destroyed structures were typically left to crumble, but in towns and village centers, there was active intervention. Ruins were raised to the ground, the remains trucked away, and sites uh, leveled. So the antique space, so here's urban fringe, in the country. We were shown this by someone we would never have found it ourselves. Uh, this is a dumping site. This is a municipal landfill site at uh, Banja Luka, and these are the remains of the Ferhadia Mosque. And they were also dumped in the bottom of a lake. This is retrieving them later. And these were the remains of the Catholic Church I told you about earlier. Their remains were trucked out of time, and those are the stones of the church. But this was more typical. This is the sites were leveled and used for car parks and dumping garbage. So that was the site of the mosque in Kozluk 
And this was the site of the Kirpicha Mosque in Bielina, so it's a classic uh, car park and garbage dump. So the war ended, and this was uh, the Fair Hadia Mosque site. Uh, so you can see completely leveled, just as the reconstruction was about to begin. The war ended in December 1995 with the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which focused on reversing the effects of ethnic cleansing in the hope of restoring Bosnia's former diversity, and it incorporated annexes on the protection of human rights and the right of return for refugees and displaced persons to their pre-war homes. However, working against this ambition was the division of Bosnia-Herzegovina into two entities, Serb-dominated Republika Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is sometimes called the Muslim Croat Federation, formed of ten ethnically dominated municipalities. And this political structure was to have a big impact, a negative impact, on the restoration of cultural and religious heritage. Now, post-conflict, a huge international military and civilian presence oversaw implementation of Dayton, and I must say there was a huge international military and civilian presence there during the war as well, but afterwards even more came in. So billions of dollars in humanitarian aid poured into the country in an enormous reconstruction state building exercise. Now uniquely Dayton had recognized the role that cultural heritage destruction played during the conflict, and among its 11 annexes, Annex A established a commission to preserve national monuments. Now, the Commission's mandate was simply to receive petitions to designate property of cultural, historical, religious, or ethnic importance, and I'm quoting, as national monuments, and it committed entity authorities to protecting and rehabilitating them. However, as refugees and the displaced began to return to the places from which they'd been ethnically cleansed, which were often still dominated by obstructive hardline nationalist and local authorities, Annex 8 was increasingly invoked in the struggle, and it was a struggle, to restore and rebuild, particularly after the Commission uh, was asked by the communities to designate sites of historic structures that had been totally destroyed during the conflict as national monuments. Thus, restoration of Bosnia's destroyed uh, and damaged heritage, in theory, should have taken place within the framework of the Dayton Agreement, supporting the return of refugees and displaced people to the homes and communities from which they'd been forcefully expelled. So how, how did international and domestic actors respond? While many of the vast array of international and intergovernmental organizations, national governments, non-governmental aid agencies in Bosnia did become caught up in cultural property restoration, it wasn't their priority at all, uh, despite the hopes of uh, the Bosnian authorities and uh, some organizations like UNESCO. Nevertheless, the um, restoration of structures like this, the Austro-Hungarian period, Central Post Office in Sarajevo did take place as part of general restoration efforts. There it was destroyed and that was it, sort of now. But where funding was specifically directed to heritage preservation, the involvement of the international community was characterized by a narrow focus on a few high profile projects, coupled with the neglect of the wider picture where ethnically cleansed populations were returning and trying to begin to reconstruct their built heritage. So given the scale of the, and nature of the destruction of cultural property, it's surprising that among the literally hundreds of NGOs that were providing post-conflict aid, only one engaged in the restoration of the built heritage. And this was the Swedish organization Cultural Heritage Without Borders, but it was funded almost entirely by SIDA, the Swedish Development Agency. Now, funding from Islamic sources was directed towards the construction of new mosques, and rarely would you ever find any money from Islamic sources going towards restoring historic Ottoman ones. Yet non-Islamic sources found involvement in the reconstruction of religious buildings problematic because they were so tied up with an ethno-national identity and they were felt they were left open to being uh, charged with favoring one of the parties in the conflict over the others. There was no international support for restoration projects in Republika Srpska or in these hardline dominated municipalities in the Federation, which wasn't all by any means, but there were a few, like Stalats, which Richard will talk about, as the donors did not want to become involved in such contentious settings. So the high profile projects were these projects which became hugely symbolic both to the international community and to the local, in the sense of Bosnian, not necessarily local where it's based, uh, so, such as the old bridge in Mostar and the National Library. This is the old bridge uh, before it was starting to be rebuilt. Here's starting to be rebuilt. So, such sites were held up as powerful symbols of Bosnia's, uh, and I'm quoting from 
project proposals for this. Multiculturalism and diversity, historic tolerance, and religious pluralism, whose reconstruction could embody the idea of a reconciliation that the international community was very keen to uh, promote, or let's say force down the throats of everybody in Bosnia in the immediate aftermath of the war. So to donors, the, the old bridge here, you can see these are actually Turkish workers, offer the best symbolic value because you could see this very visible symbol, pro, visible material process of bridge building. So once the World Bank endorsed the old bridge uh, uh, reconstruction, it was into Mostar that the international community poured most of its resources <coughs> for heritage res restoration or reconstruction to the exclusion of practically everything else. So. There's when it reopened. Right. So there was very little linkage of heritage restoration with the return process or with issues of rights and justice and human rights for the survivors of ethnic cleansing. Yet the majority of historic structures in need of restoration were in those places where ethnic cleansing had taken place. Now, Cultural Heritage Without Borders, uh, uh, just take a look at them, the only NGO, international or domestic, which engaged in restoring war damaged historic structures function in an exemplary way. They work closely with local heritage institutions, uh, trading young architects, use local contractors and community volunteers, it restored mosques and Orthodox church museums and vernacular houses. However, um, it, it, its reliance on CEDA uh, made the organization very subject to CEDA's uh, ever-changing political projects. Uh, uh, priorities and their uh, one attempt to actually integrate return of refugees. This is Yaitse, which is a little mosque, and this is the mosque restored. Well, that's uh, the Orthodox Church in Zavala. This is the community volunteer working uh, to help restore the church. This is the interior. It had these very famous frescoes, uh, but here is Yaitse again. So that was Yaitse. This is the same location. The mosque is just nearby. So this was the only attempt that they made to kind of integrate return of refugees, or, ex or should say expelled persons. They weren't all refugees. Some were displaced to their houses. These are these historic um, Yaitse houses with restoring their wider environment, such as the little mosque we saw. That, that was only made only one attempt to do that. And it was never replicated elsewhere, uh, mostly because of CEDA, because there were some problems. And CEDA didn't want to deal with have any anything to do with this. So they wouldn't fund any further such projects. And uh, Cultural Heritage Without Borders also it never carried out any work in, in Republika Srpska. And in addition, it um, strictly followed international conservation codes like the Venice Charter, which you say is good. But they were greatly concerned with the issue of the question of authenticity and would only carry out uh, reconstructions or restorations where at least 30% of the original structure remained. So, but if, as we've seen, due to the nature of the destruction, a large proportion of heritage reconstruction projects were necessarily going to going to be either complete replicas or uh, archaeological restorations which incorporated as much of the destroyed structure as possible. This is the Fair Hadiya Mosque. This is Mohammed Hamidovich, the uh, in charge of the restoration uh, with these recovered fragments. This is the story store ground where they had these fragments recorded from, you know, recovered from the bottom of the lake and the landfill site. Here's someone recording them. Uh, here's someone working with some of the old stones you see and some new stones. Uh, but um, I say the, these archaeological restorations, or they were just new builds, which weren't usually not very exciting. Richard will talk about them. But uh, so perhaps the most uh, influential, important actors in post-conflict cultural property restoration were actually the communities which had been ethnically cleansed and were now dispersed around Bosnia and uh, regionally across the world. And here are some returnees <coughs> that we uh, encountered uh, in Zvornik. This is what the building looked like before it was destroyed. It's the sheikh, uh, a turbe of a Sufi sheikh. And there they're reconstructing. You can still you see the little tombstone, that uh, gravestone that's supplied. So they literally focus on restoring the communities and assorting their rights in the public space, including the reconstruction of the built marks of their identity. And these reconstructions often acted as an incentive uh, for people to uh, return. So sustained by absent diasporas and supporters, usually through the me medium of community websites, many returning communities chose to reconstruct their destroyed built heritage as it had been built, uh, as it had been at the point of destruction. So even in some quite remote locations, 
this is stall outs. This is the uh, returnees starting the process of rebuilding this mosque. This is the fragments. There they are working. This is it almost finished, and that's the first prayers in the restored mosque. So Plana, again, is this remote rural location. Nobody went back there, uh, but they still chose to rebuild these monuments. And this is the Fair Hadiyah Mosque as it was restored. I think I better turn over to Richard to look at the time. It's like my eyesight, isn't it? I can't even see my presentation. Oh, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you a, an introduction. I'm not going to read. I'm just going to give you an introduction to kind of Bosnian heritage, Bosnian cultural heritage, in the hope that you'll all flock over there. In the same way that Liam's hoping you'll flock over to Northern Ireland sometime soon. Um, it's a great place. Uh, don't be put off by anything I say or anything you've heard from Helen. It really is a great place and nothing to be afraid of. That's just as a precursor to what I'm going to say. Um, um, so my involvement really started with going to Bosnia doing ethnographic and archaeological research in the, before the war, actually, in the 80s, um, and then sort of um, morphed into doing this kind of cultural heritage um, work. Um, I'm not an expert on the political situation, but you have to know something about it. And so I thought I'd start off by... Um, by this is going to be a test on this later, by the way, so pay attention. Um, I'm not going to talk much about this, but this really just models or reflects the complexity of Bosnia in all respects. It re reflects the mentality of the people and the landscape. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, but it's not always simple. And you can see on the left the situation before the war, um, with a sort of dis a population of kind of fairly highly mixed population, um, after the Second World War, Tito forced people to go back to their hearths, as he called it. So, um, so they didn't necessarily always want to, but they went back to their hearths, and that was the situation on the left um, before the war. Um, it, after the war, the situation is on the right, and you can see there are now two main entities. There's a Republika Subska, which is the thing that's mostly in red, which is sort of self-defined, it's mostly occupied by Serbs now. And then there's the rest, which is the um, loosely sort of amalgamated um, federation of Croats and Muslims who don't tend to get on, um, but they're forced together. And you'll see there's been sort of major shifts of population. The Croats have kind of consolidated in what's in Western Herzegovina at the bottom of the, of the map. Um, and the Serbs have consolidated within the boundaries of the Republic of Srpska. Muslims generally shifted to the middle and to the northwest, and they've basically been kicked out. Muslims have, have been largely displaced from eastern Bosnia. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated even than that. Uh, that's the modern map of Bosnia. Since, since the previous map in 1998, a new entity in Bosnia was formed, which is uh, Bučko, which is the, the black area at the top right of the, of the picture. Basically, the international community and Bosnians couldn't agree um, whether Bučko should fall within the Federation or the Republika Srpska, so they decided, well, we'll make a new entity and call it Bučko District, <laughs> which effectively separates the two bits of Republika Srpska. And as Helen also said, there are ten um, cantons in the Federation area, um, one of which, amusingly, is called Canton 10, because they couldn't agree on its name. Um, in the same way that the Bosnian National Anthem doesn't have words, because they couldn't agree on text. <laughs> So that's a little bit of context. Um, so what is, what is cultural heritage? Cultural heritage is more than just the buildings. It's, it's the archaeology as well. I'm not going to talk about the archaeology, but this is a late Iron Age <coughs> hill fort. It looks a bit different from late Iron Age Northumbrian hill forts. Um, and it's, it's an amazing structure if anyone gets a chance to go. It's just outside the town of Stolitz in a village called Oshinichi. Um, it was, as Liam's alluded to, it was used uh, in Northern Ireland. It was, it was used during the war, this war and previous wars, as an artillery position, um, like many hill forts were. It didn't really suffer a great deal from that. Um, it suffered more from sort of 
post-conflict uh, reconstruction in a way, when it was, it was sort of brought into life as a tourist um, destination, and they, they even put a, a large container on site and sold ice creams for a while. And that didn't work. That's, that just attracted people to it. It made it known. It attracted what you might call the wrong sort of people. The, the container was burnt out. You know, the little tables they put out were, were, were destroyed. And uh, I think it's better just sort of quietly forgotten and visited by people who really care about it. It is an amazing site, sort of Mycenaean almost in its sort of complexity. Um, so heritage is also non-tangible, as has also been alluded to. So um, pottery, for example, on the left, lime burning, top right, um, wood turning, bottom right. All of those things actually survived the war pretty well because people had to fall back, you know, as you might imagine, on their own resources. And, um, and so, for example, and I'll see some pictures in a minute, had to use uh, water mills to generate electricity or to, or to grind corn in the absence of alternatives. Pottery is done particularly well and still, is still fairly, you know, survives, survives well using that technology still today. Lime burning, likewise, survives pretty well without any government support, obviously. They're just things that are needed by the population, so they continue to be used. And non tangible heritage also refers to things such as um, we, we came across this chap a couple of years ago in eastern Herzegovina, near to um, Gatsko, a town called Gatsko, which is now entirely depopulated of Muslims, although the population before the war was majority Muslim. And this guy is pointing out to his grand, he's just visiting for the day from somewhere else from Sarajevo, I think, as a refugee, he's pointing out to his daughter some graffiti that he scratched on that rock when he was a kid about her age. And so I just wanted to make the point that, you know, what is, what is, what is culture, what is cultural heritage, it's about sort of memory of landscape, it's about attaching memories to the landscape, and all of that goes when you displace a population. Knowledge of the, the names of hills, who did what where, all goes with the, with the population. Um, so, I, I mean, Helen's talked a lot about the um, particularly sacred buildings, but sort of um, the principal heritage sites of Bosnia, the built heritage sites of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And here are some of the others um, buildings that don't get talked about. Um, as much some some you know domestic dwellings for example um, they are I mean you would expect if you looked at sort of examples in Newcastle or in York that timber frame buildings might survive quite a long time in Boston where you've got good resources of hardwood what have you these sort of buildings tend not to survive more than about two generations um, unless they're very very heavily protected and I suspect some of the ones in, in Varish maybe uh, as the ones in uh, in uh, Yaitse, which Helen showed pictures of but the majority of these sort of domestic buildings fall into the category that Peter talked about earlier of buildings that end up falling down through neglect rather than anything else. They're not valued. Um, they were targeted, particularly during the war, but they, unfortunately they, they just fall down. And, they, and the, the number of these sort of buildings, domestic buildings in, in Bosnia, has, has dramatically fallen since the war through neglect. But then again, neglect, why neglect? You know, it's because Bosnia, partly due to the war, is an impoverished country. If these buildings were somewhere, you know, close within the, on the periphery of Dubrovnik or something, they'd have been bought by Germans and English and, and converted into holiday houses. Um, that's not going to happen in Bosnia, which is the second poorest country in Europe. Um, in the southwest and the southeast, particularly in Herzegovina, domestic buildings look more like this. Um, if you took the building on the top left and to an extent more on the top right out of its context and took away some fig trees and tortoises you could easily put that into Northumberland and call it a vassal of the you know, late 16th century, early 17th century, characterised by metre-thick walls, no windows on the ground floor, um, drawbar tunnels, um, and also, if you look at the picture on the, the bottom left, an escape hatch through the, the cold roof. So you get these, these are later, these are probably kind of 18th century, even early 19th century buildings. Um, they're not recorded um, and gradually they're, they're also falling down, but not quite at the same rate as the wooden ones in Bosnia. Um, other kinds of buildings that don't get looked at, don't get considered, again falling out of use um, and falling down through neglect. These are in Popovo Polje, which is in eastern Herzegovina in the southeast. Again, only about within an hour of Dubrovnik, uh, but nobody ever goes there. And these are, these are grain stores. Again, 19th century, they would have survived in use until probably into the mid-20th century, and since then they've just fallen into decay. Again, they're not being recorded, and they, and they merit um, at least some record before they go altogether. Um, 
mills and industrial buildings, another category of, uh, of, of um, sort of what you might call unprotected sort of cultural heritage in terms of the built, um, built heritage in Bosnia. Mills are generally of this um, vertical axle type, what in this country are called something called kick mills or Shetland mills. Um, they went out of use in this country, you know, by the, mostly by the 12th century. Um, but they survived until the war in vast numbers in, in, in Bosnia. They're now, again, going out of use because there's no further use for them. You know, the war helped them in a sense because people needed them, now they're going out of use. And again, they have a lifetime of about sort of 10 or 20 years before they need completely replacing. Um, another larger, larger mill, so sometimes they're built over larger rivers. They're virtually always vertical axle. And this one um, is run by a lady, as you can see, and has several, um, several uh, turning wheels, about five, I think, altogether. So in terms of um, reconstruction, very briefly, in terms of reconstruction, uh, what happened after the war, few, a lot of money came in quickly from um, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia in particular, and things like that were built, which don't in any way reflect what Bosnian built tradition is all about. Um, they reflect what the funders wanted. Um, and the local people, in a sense, don't really, a lot of them, you get the sense, they don't really care whether they're Muslim, you know, Catholic or Orthodox, they don't care as long as they get their sacral building built on their site. They don't mind. This one was built very, very soon, within a year or two following the war, and it's built more of a more as a castle in some ways. You know, it's got this sort of large, almost barmkin going around the outside of it. Um, this is what happens now. You know, it, I mean, these sort of buildings are going up now in Eastern Herzegovina, mostly as as um, Helen talked about earlier. They're sort of memorial mosques because. People are never going to go back and live in those areas, at least not in the current climate. So, a lot, so these are built by public subscription, local public subscription, um, maybe £50,000 or so, and that builds you um, your, your own mosque. You get your own mosque built in the style that you always had it, in the traditional uh, Herzegovinian style. And there are more here, more of the same sort of things. The one on the right of Blastra with the, uh, with the wall plaque, um, giving you a sort of clear indication of what they think of what happened during the war. Um, so, Stolats, just a few slides showing example of a particular locality where there are distinct competing interests here between Catholics, define themselves as Croats, and Muslims. Um, Catholics in the slight majority and control the local government. Um, some buildings have been reconstructed, such as the mosque at top left. Other buildings have been constructed to look as though they've been reconstructed. This is actually it's a new tech here on the right hand side there, top right. Um, buildings, bottom left, sort of this residential assemblage, again, reconstructed, like Helen says, um, in the Ottoman style. People, people want to recreate what they had, even if it's out of breeze block, they don't care, as long as it looks something remotely similar to what they had. Um, competing interests. Again, this is on the site of, or close to the site of the mosque, which Helen just talked about in Stolats. Um, then the, the, the local Muslims put up, we re-erected the clock tower, which had actually fallen down, I think, in the early part of the 20th century, but they re-erected it as if that had fallen down during the war. And then the Croats came in, competing interests, and built their new, whatever it is, seminary. And the other tower on the left, on the right-hand side there, so it's, it's constant competition, um, a war of competition almost, which is better than the real war. But, um, Croats tend to go in for these kind of very modernist structures when they're building their church towers. Serbs have gone for a very sort of traditional Byzantine blueprint. Um, the, the castle is, a, is an odd one. I mean, the, the castle has been reconstructed virtually, you know, largely in parts rebuilt in style. It's, it's a fine castle. Um, uh, and it's, the, the Croat uh, local government then erected a cross in the top right picture. You can just see the cross at the back there. However, during the process of reconstruction, they found a mosque in it, which was going to be part of the Ottoman castle. So there were a few you know, difficulties ensued there. Um, water mills in Stolets, um, again, they've been reconstructed. They're, again, not much, I mean, you can see they weren't destroyed because, uh, because they were of any sort of, uh, for, for any particular military gain. They were probably destroyed either collaterally or because they were owned by people from the other side. So they, they disappeared in that way. They've been rebuilt, lots of them. Um, and again, there are these multiple wheel, um, vertical axle wheel, uh, 
um, mills. Again, reconstructed without too much regard for materials and sensitivity towards uh, methods of construction, as long as they look something remotely like what was there before. Um, and and a, a class of monument that is very, very common in Bosnia, you get in places in Serbia and, and Croatia as well, Stetice, which are late medieval grave markers, some beautifully decorated, some not decorated at all. Some of them you find on little hills in the countryside, some you find by the side of the road. The best assemblage is at the right of the view here, uh, Radimir, just outside Stolac, um, beautiful site. And again, th there was no competition in a sense here. All sides agreed that they collectively or individually owned these monuments, and so they weren't targeted um, for any damage or destruction. And then finally, sorry? Yeah, just a couple, couple more minutes. And, uh, Two more. Stolac, orth um, an orth interesting case, Orthodox church, uh, again just outside um, Stolac, protected by, just partly destroyed by Catholics, now protected by, or protected by Muslims during the war and subsequently. Um, and then last three slides, I think. This is um, Gatsko in, the, in Herzegovina, in eastern Herzegovina. Um, we visited in order to look at the reconstruction of the mosque on the right. So Gatsko is the town, it's got a road leading to that mosque, you can see on the right. We came across, this is, this is just to exemplify current issues. We came um, across these stones and other debris in the road deliberately put there on prayer day, on a Friday, just to annoy people. Not necessarily dramatically intimidate, just to annoy them. And it's a constant process of people being worn down. Um, and this is the context of Gatsko, where you have on the bottom right another memorial mosque. There are no Muslims left in Gatsko, but they've built their, they've rebuilt their mosque. And then you get this sort of thing, and I could have shown a lot more of these than I would have done if I know Liam was showing some of these lovely murals as well. There's, there's some nice murals here. There's one of Ratko Mladic on top right on the tile block, who's an indicted war criminal. And then there are other, some, some friendly um, Serbian uh, paramilitaries at the bottom left there. And then the, the house of the Fatherland War uh, is the other plaque on the top left. Um, and then this it was a very interesting case. We came across a brand new memorial. I could have talked a lot about war memorials. But a uh, brand new memorial um, to Muslims killed in the First World War whilst protecting um, their country against the Austro-Hungarian tyranny. And this is specifically put there by Muslims in a Serb-dominated area to say, look, we're on your side, let us stay. Because, you know, they've been otherwise, I mean, their houses are entirely devastated. And then the very last one, I guarantee. Another plaque, again, put there, you can see, I think in June 2016, so less than a year ago, on a destroyed old school next to this mosque here, which was the only mosque in Eastern Herzegovina which survived um, the current war with its minaret intact. But that was because it was destroyed in 1942 and they never bothered rebuilding it. Um, so this, and this plaque here, Again, giving context to the, to the whole process of potential reconstruction is, is in commemoration of, I think it's 47 Serbs killed by the local Croats in the Second World War. So people are constantly looking back. This is the context, the historical context. People are constantly looking back. And I know Liam really will be familiar with this in Northern Ireland. And, um, and I'd just like to, as a final comment, if you would find this sort of thing archaeologically in 500 years' time, you know, think about Roman memorials, how would you interpret it? You know, in that sense, context was really everything. Thanks a lot.